Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today in the panel discussion webinar hosted by Moonspeak as we discuss the safety and security of digital assets. I'm Roy from DeFi, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. And we have with us today representative from Moonspeak, Tokenized Exchange, and Merkle Science to discuss some ways on how institutions can ensure digital assets are safe and secure, something that is definitely applicable to the current landscape of cryptocurrency, I'm sure. So we'll answer a few panel discussion and we'll open the floor up for a quick Q&A session. So please feel free to send any question your way in the chat button below. So without further ado, let me introduce the CEO of Moonstake, Mr. Lawrence, to give us some speech. Mr. Lawrence, please. Uh, it's, it's not going to be a speech, but thank you, Roy. Uh, again, happy Chinese New Year. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, so many attendees with, with us. Um, I'm very excited to be able to share about uh, decentralized and centralized about crypto and blockchain with our fellow experts uh, in this um, golden bull year and definitely in an ultra bull run. Um, so I'm Lawrence, I'm from Moonscape. Uh, Moonscape is a staking pool and wallet solution provider. We have a B2C and a B2B component. Uh, for the B2C, we have our mobile app, uh, Play Store, uh, Apple Store, and a web platform. You can easily transfer your tokens into the wallet and then skate accordingly in a staking pool supported by us in Ada, Kazos, Polkadot. Uh, we also have an institutional uh, solution for wallet enterprise and uh, API connection through SDK to our staking pool. Uh, currently, we hold uh, more than uh, 500 uh, million uh, worth of assets and very excited to be able to collaborate and see if there's any other institutions uh, willing to join us. Um, I'll hand over the bacon to Chi and let him introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, Chi here, the founder and also the CEO and CTO of Tokenized Exchange. So we are a cryptocurrency exchange that started in Singapore back in uh, late 2017. And uh, in 2019, uh, we are one of the three licensed exchange in Malaysia. And now we are under uh, MS injections uh, in a cryptocurrency offerings. Yeah, nice, nice to see you all here and nice to be with Lawrence and Ian today. So I will pass uh, my baton now to Ian for the introductions. Yeah. Thank you, T. And uh, thank you, DeFi. Thank you, Moonstake, for having us here today. Um, as kindly introduced, my name is Ian, and I'm one of the founding members and the associate director of Merkle Science. Um, briefly speaking, you know, Merkle Science is a blockchain transaction monitoring and intelligence company. So basically, we work with you know businesses like exchanges, custodian, wallet providers, um, as well as financial institutions, in order to provide them with compliance services around the cryptocurrencies that they deal with. So as cryptocurrencies become more and more popular, naturally, you know, uh, we don't just see retail and institutions come in, we see bad actors who want to use cryptocurrency for things like money laundering, terrorist financing. And so what we do is to assist these companies in helping them identify when these bad actors want to utilize their platform so as to create, you know, a more regulated and safe um, cryptocurrency environment. And so with that, over back to, I think, uh, Roy. Oh, thank you so much, guys, for the introduction. So. I think that's great. So I think to kickstart our panel discussion for today, I think it'd be good for us to visit the central theme of our session today, centralized or decentralized. And how can institutions ensure that digital assets are safe and secure? So without further ado, our first question uh, for the panel panelists here today is, what are the advantages of DeFi over traditional finance in order to encourage more allocation of assets from institutions? So Lawrence, what's your take on this? Well, uh, apart from the fact that currently we are in an ultra bull run, uh, in fact, we are in a correct correction period. So, um, you know, it, it might be a good time to buy some more BTCs, uh, not financial advice. Uh, all the fact that this industry is 24 hours, seven, you know, you don't have people sleeping, you don't have a, you know, company saying, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm on leave, uh, please don't disturb me. There's no such thing in this business. Uh, I think the, the immediate, um, Proposition here is that the cost of uh, managing assets or even transactions is much lower. So for example, uh, for BTC currently, a, a transaction fee on average is about $24 USD. Uh, there has been cases of a billion dollar worth of BTC transfer and the transaction cost uh, or the gas fee is only 649. Uh, so I think that itself is something that is definitely unheard of and uh, the cost of um, 
um, collaborating with partners of having uh, cascading and etc. Uh, I'm sure it's much lower and uh, much higher returns. Great. Uh, just to add on to that, so I think you know one of the really exciting things about these DeFi platforms is that, um, well, they run automatically on the blockchain, right? Which means that they operate twenty four seven. Unlike some of you know your traditional financial products like the stock market, where they are subject to strict operating hours. DeFi really runs 24 seven, which means anytime you wake up, you're interested to, you know, um, explore DeFi, you can immediately, you know, find access to some of these um, DeFi platforms and pools. Um, as well as the other advantage that I think that DeFi has over traditional finances, as it stands today, it's still relatively unregulated, I'd say. Um, and the advantage that that has is that it really opens up to a wider audience pool. Right, with traditional financial products, oftentimes it's only restricted to perhaps accredited investors. And you know, as the stock market grows, we're seeing instances where um, a lot of opportunities are really just restricted to a small subset of people who are there, who have you know um, enough money right to participate. Whereas with DeFi, there's really no minimum cost, right? And there's no restrictions. Anybody from any part of the world now has an opportunity to access some of these financial products um, that were previously really just limited to a small subset. Yep. I, th I think I have to, uh, you know, agree with what Ian, uh, Ian said. I think um, DeFi, to be honest, has been a space. I mean, like even Bitcoin is uh, considered DeFi, right? Like uh, part of the DeFi initial uh, concept. But I think things accelerate a lot when uh, Ethereum blockchains come into the play. Uh, however, there are a lot of issues. I think back then in 18 and 19, 2018 and 2019, is that, you know, there are a lot of efficiency. You know, there's a liquidity issue uh, in the DeFi. And things accelerated a lot last year when we only looked like six, seven months ago, you know, with uh, Compound, Yen Finance coming to the play. The whole liquidity issue seems, you know, um, resolved, right? And, uh, and like what Ian said, accessibility, like, you know, during this COVID lock, uh, lock, lockdown, although we can't travel, but, you know, the crypto communities able to connect, you know, through this DeFi and proper a lot of interesting products from a liquidity pools kind of DeFi products, staking to, you know, synthetic, even uh, say knowledge, right? Or programmable uh, stable coin. So I think there are a lot of interesting concept is ongoing into the space right now. Uh, I think the only key challenge I would say, you know, um, we, we still pretty much um, have a similar issue back in late 2017 where gas fee uh, is, still a, is, is still a challenge, right? Uh, in the DeFi space, yeah. But it's interesting to see where this goes next. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, you know, guys, for sharing. And uh, just a disclaimer, I, I think I want to give uh, some explanation to everyone who is here today. DeFi stands for decentralized finance, just in case you know <laughs> you guys are not sure what does DeFi stands for. So I think moving on to the next questions uh, for today. And before I move on to the next question, please remember that if you have any questions that you wish to have. Uh, the panelists address later, please feel free to write it down in the Q&A button below. So for the second question for today, it will be how does cryptocurrency and blockchain address the issue of privacy and cybersecurity pertaining to digital asset protection? I think that is a very important question and most people here might be very interested to know how they can protect their digital asset, especially during you know, times like this where most coins are going up and down and most of them are trading as well. So Lawrence, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, right, so um, straight off the bat, like blockchain itself uh, is saying is, is something that traditional industries uh, might feel very surprised of. Is basically um, all the transactions and addresses are transparent and all the records can be found online. Uh, that can be scary to some people in, in traditional companies, uh, especially for banks, because uh, you don't have that kind of open um, uh, uh, records that can be easily found through you know, just searching online. Uh, but what this means also is that uh, it's very easy to track um, bad actors. It's very easy to find out who has your assets if something go wrong. Um, the other thing is also it's very easy to see what else everyone's doing. So that's why you have a, a um, uh, watch gods or, or traders who, who watch those major addresses to see 
uh, the funds, you can uh, easily Google search uh, BTC or DeFi uh, funds movement. Um, so how does this uh, help change your institutions? So uh, if something go wrong, it's very easy to track what is going to happen after that. But even before something go wrong, uh, you know, is you can immediately have, it's a very robust ecosystem where you can just transfer your funds to an exchange, to trade, uh, if you go on to have the gate to gate trade, you can you know, transfer your, your funds to a staking pools uh, for proof of stake coins uh, to stake and earn the yields. Uh, we're just you know, letting it uh, sit there. Uh, or you, you feel like, okay, something's going to happen, or you, you, you don't feel so secure, you can put a, put a ratio. So you can always transfer your funds to uh, Cascade Gains and you take care of your funds. When you need it, then you, you, you know, transfer out. Uh, and it's all on the blockchain, so everything is tracked, uh, it's fast, the, the fees are much lower. Uh, again, of course, you have like uh, foreign things and AML experts uh, like Mercury Science. You can also have KYC uh, to, to, to know your customers. Uh, so all in all, I think your ecosystem has uh, developed over the past few years and it definitely is, uh, is, is secure and is robust enough. Uh, so, oh. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Lawrence, I will add on to that. Um, so uh, definitely, if you see, uh, I will be coming from more of a, a regulated exchange stance point, right? Uh, definitely cryptocurrency has its own uniqueness on uh, privacy and cryptocurrency itself come from crypto, you know, we stand for cryptography. Uh, it is as a, you know, a secure architect as, as, as best as possible, right? Uh, but the, the only exportation points normally is always the exchange or on the application layers. That is, is where we always heard a lot of hacking incidents and a lot of uh, uh, cyber security threat. Right? Uh, but I think the good thing, you know, I, I'm speaking on a regulated exchange uh, angle is that we have regulators always behind us as a governance body. So on the cyber security side, right? Um, you know, definitely we have accountability and we have someone that check and balance us to ensure that our standard is uh, putting in, in, the, in the right level. So on, on, uh, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will come into that perspective and go. Um, and at the same time on the privacy side, I think, you know, later we can hear from Ian. I think um, one thing quite uh, maybe, you know, uh, will, will, will slowly become an, an alarm, alarming concern is that, uh, with the rising of debts and also rising of uh, DeFi, how can we, we preserve the, you know, the spirit of privacy of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency, but at the same time, able to comply with the regulations that evolve uh, nowadays, right? I think it will getting pretty challenged, right? Like how can we ensure that um, DeFi space can't be mis, uh, you know, uh, misused or being abused to be a tool for money launderers and all the bad actors. I think this is uh, getting, uh, you know, um, um, maybe a threat or, you know, getting a concerns, right? So yeah, we will pass to Ian so that, you know, what what is his thoughts on, on, on this kind of development, right? Thank you. So yes, as a company that specializes in blockchain analytics, you know, obviously we spend a lot of time analyzing blockchain data. So I think firstly, I want to clear up, you know, some misconceptions that people might have. Because, you know, sometimes when for people who are just entering the space, they learn about blockchain and they learn that blockchain is a distributed ledger, which means that all this information is shared across the entire world. And so people are like, wow, no privacy. And then they read about things like, oh, Bitcoin is anonymous, right? That's why drug traffickers like to use Bitcoin. Then suddenly, you know, they get a little bit confused. But like, on the one hand, you're saying all this information is public. But then on the other hand, people are saying Bitcoin is anonymous. So how does this, what, what do you mean by that, right? It seems like an inherent conflict. Um, firstly, I want to say is that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are not anonymous. The more accurate term to describe them is pseudonymous, which means that looking at blockchain data, we don't actually know who it is that controls the wallet, but we can see all the transactions that that wallet has done in the past, right? And this gives us a lot of useful information in terms of, you know, tracking um, analytics for compliance purposes, for tracing purposes, um, and in, in fact, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that law enforcement has actually had more success tracking cryptocurrencies than they had with cash because of the fact that all this information is on this public database, right? So the first issue I want to address is that 
um, cryptocurrency is not anonymous, right? It is not as um, easy for people to launder money as what they read on the news, right? There are ways for us to um, protect against this. You know, exchanges can use systems to analyze where their clients are sending funds, where are they processing withdrawals to, in order to block, you know, criminal actors from accessing their platforms, right? That's something that regulators are increasingly expecting companies to do. Um, but the other part of it, the fact that blockchain is a distributed ledger, what this means is that all the data that's actually stored inside the blockchain is not just stored in one location, right? It's stored in multiple locations around the world, which means that everyone who is running a Bitcoin node is actually playing a part in securing the network, right? Because while it might be easy for you to hack one database, can you imagine having to hack the 10,000 different Bitcoin nodes around the world? Right, that becomes very, very challenging. Right? So when we talk about cybersecurity, there's the other aspect that we need to realize that blockchain is really more of a database and it's a secure database that doesn't allow people to tamper with the data inside. But the data inside is not 100% anonymous, it is pseudonymous. Right? And there are ways that we can um, analyze this and build software to protect businesses who are dealing with digital assets. All right, thank you so much, Ian and um, Lawrence as well, Chi. But we have this question, Although we are not moving a Q&A immediately, but we have a question that is by Joshua Wong that's pertaining to this topic. So it's uh, for Moonstake, so it's for Lawrence. So for Moonstake Staking Pool, can you share a bit on how do you make revenue from the stake assets to pay stakers their interest? And also, does this whole staking pool centralized concept not run contrary to the decentralized use case of cryptocurrency? And doesn't it pose a tempting target for hackers as well? Right, so uh, again, uh, thank you for the question. So a quick answer here is uh, how Moonscape earns revenue is uh, having a fee um, from the uh, profit of the yields earned. Um, so for example, if, if your annual returns is uh, 10%, maybe we will we'll, uh, get a 1% cut, for example. Uh, so is, is a staking pool centralized? Uh, no. So what happened is uh, all these proof of stake coins have this staking pool concept. Uh, this was since uh, Q17. Uh, the first one would be like Kezos and Ega. And then now with D5 projects, uh, this staking uh, um, fundamental has become very attractive. Uh, reason being why not stake uh, and earn yields? Again, you don't have to keep trading. Uh, so what happened is these staking pools are actually nodes or, 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 or server points on the blockchain itself. So it's actually a decentralized, uh, you can call it a decentralized holder. Uh, you, don't, you don't exactly deposit your, your coins inside. What you're doing is you are um, staking, you're saying that in this smart contract, I'm, I'm putting this for a certain amount of period, right? So you're not exactly transferring the, 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 the assets into this, uh, the, this node. So this is a very important point. Uh, you're just, uh, uh, transferring the, a, a contract to say that I, I want to put this in this note to get this yield. Uh, and then, uh, so the answer to the question is actually is a decentralized approach to get yields. Uh, and guess why it's secure? Because your, your, your assets are actually still with you. The private key is still with you. Uh, and then you can skate and skate uh, based on your blockchain uh, um, uh, rules and, 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 uh, and, your own, and your own comfort. Right. Thank you, Lawrence, for addressing, and I hope Joshua Lawrence has addressed your question. So next question is that I'll proceed to the next panel questions that I have prepared. So basically, the next panel question will be, what are some of the non-financial risks in decentralized finance that you can share with investors? Because we have been sharing with so many other financial risks that has been involved, right? So what are some of the non-financial risks in decentralized finance that you can share with investors? Lawrence, please. Uh, you know, financial risk, uh, immediate one, uh, as always, uh, as, as I talk to uh, anyone, everyone is, again, be ultra bull be bear run, please go formal. Um, especially for DeFi, there are projects that don't even have people inside, it's all names, like pickles and, and, and strawberries and, and corn and, and all sorts of animals and, and fruits have come out. Um, the risk is you putting money, um, the, the yields might vary, they might run away, they might dump everything. Uh, it might get hacked because the, the project blockchain is not mature enough, it's still you know, at the startup stage. Uh, so again, always do a due diligence, uh, talk to experts, uh, if like staking pools or you know, 
uh, regulator exchange or you know blockchain and like its experts and, 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 and make sure you you cover your 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 risk assessments yeah okay so coming from an exchange perspective to you do you have anything to add on so I, I think on the exchange side right we are getting from you know from previously we are not being regulated industry to now you know most of the jurisdictions now they are regulated uh, intermediaries like us right so when, when, when the regulation has come to into play, there are more accountability and governance. But DeFi, I think, you know, they are trying to get um, um, a bit different path. You know, they are more technology focused and, you know, it's, it's a more borderless kind of concept. So, you know, like, like platform like what uh, Lawrence tried to say, Pickers and others. And, and things has been evolved from ICO days to now that um, has been a bit totally different landscape where, you know, we don't even know that platform of DeFi platform, uh, it, it won't be stated which company is behind this or which, who are the key member or management team of, of, of that platform, right? So I think all these things constitute a financial risk, right? One day they can be decided just to close their, uh, although they are operating in a blockchain layer, like on, a, uh, on, the, on their application, uh, but they can just vanish um, you know, um, in the next few days, right? There's nothing can stop them uh, because the website that they use to host the application is still pretty centralized, right? Although smart contract they, they are utilized is decentralized, but you know, they are increasing risk that uh, it's a technology risk actually, like smart contract, they will, be, they will have bugs and everything. But those smart contract right now is associated with uh, financial elements. Right, because uh, the users or the investors are literally using their real money to participate into their applications. And all these things now become a um, financial risk. So I think the, 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 the rule of thumb is always, you know, putting only the money that you can afford to lose and understand that, you know, DeFi is still at the early stage, just like cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, industry. We are still in a very, very early stage. So, you know, a lot of things uh, uh, constitute a uh, high, high risk and, uh, you know, we have to really be prudent and be conscious in, in experimenting, uh, experimenting all these uh, new innovations, right? I think that, that this will be my advice and my uh, 50 cents of thoughts. Yeah. How about Ian? Yep. Yep. Ian, from a compliance perspective. Yeah. I mean, I really want to echo what Thierry said. Um, I mean, just, just to say one, two lines about DeFi so that everybody's on the same page. So DeFi stands for Decentralized um, Finance, um, which is basically, you know, computer programs that have been deployed inside the blockchain that allows people to interact directly with the computer program to access these products. So let's be very clear. When you participate in DeFi, you are not giving your money to a company. You're not giving your money to any individual. You are giving your money to a computer program that somebody has created and stored in the blockchain. Now, the problem that DeFi has is that, yes, it's garnered a lot of attention. A lot of people are putting a lot of money in, but not a lot of people actually understand how these computer programs that govern these DeFi platforms operate, right? A lot of these DeFi platforms have been started by people who may not have the necessary expertise, right? Who simply copy the code from somewhere else. And I feel that a lot of people are not really you know, auditing these DeFi smart contracts right, to make sure that they have no bugs, to make sure there's no backdoors that allows the creator to perhaps siphon the money out. And we've seen in the past many instances of smart contracts being hacked because of you know, wrong code um, or because of a mistake that the creators made. Right. So one of the benefits, so although DeFi is great, honestly, in my perspective, you know, typically I would go, I would put my money through these DeFi into these DeFi platforms through either centralized, like regulated centralized exchanges or companies like Moonstake, because at least I have the assurance that these are companies that have their technical experts audit the smart contracts because I know I don't have the expertise, right? And rely on them, right? To have their guys make sure that the smart contracts are actually, you know, operating properly. So that's one of the, the risks. Um, the other thing that, you know, she mentioned as well is that, you know, a lot of these DeFi platforms, there's a lack of clarity as to who should be held responsible in the event that something went wrong, right? Some of these DeFi platforms don't even have the founders um, made known, right? So you got to be asking yourself, like, why is this guy hiding behind a screen name, right? What's he afraid of, right? If he's offering a legitimate service, right? Then yeah, he shouldn't have anything to hide. Um, and then finally, DeFi is 
increasingly becoming more popular, but I, I do echo what they said as like, this is like the early ICO days where regulators have not yet had the time to think about what are the frameworks that should be implemented to make sure that people who access these DeFi platforms are properly protected, right? They don't do KYC, they don't do AML checks, you know, they don't do any kind of, um, very, I won't say all, but most of them may not have, you know, proper um, compliance processes in place to, to protect themselves, right? So that's another reason why, you know, sometimes going through regulated exchange or companies like Moonstake, at least, you know, if you're putting your money with them, you can trust them to act as that gatekeeper, right? To make sure that the projects that they interact with are legitimate. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ian, for sharing. So as we're talking so much into the, basically, compliance topic right so i'll basically like to also go on to the next uh, question of the day that is uh, related directly to market science as well so most analytics use chain analysis to detect if a coin has been to the dark web right so could someone do multiple jumps to avoid detections great question and um please bear with me this may be a slightly longer answer than what, than what i usually give so the question of you know um potential criminals moving their funds through multiple transactions um in the blockchain analytics space we call this we term this hops right they hop their funds through multiple wallets right so when we do analysis oftentimes people come to us and say oh how many hops back do you analyze right now, for sure, we've seen criminals try to move their funds through multiple addresses, accounts in order to hide where they got it from. And while multiple transactions or hops may be useful to evade traditional monitoring, where the information available to banks are limited, again, you know, somebody walks into the bank with a million dollars, you don't really know where he got it before that. But with blockchain, you know, we are exposed to the entire transaction history of every single address out there. That means that if a cryptocurrency has moved through multiple hops originating from a dark net, we can actually see that because I can actually tell you where every single Bitcoin has passed through right from it was first mined, right? All that data is available. The question is, how do you use it? And so the bigger problem is actually not the fact that criminals are moving their funds through multiple hops. The bigger problem is that compliance officers are struggling to decide how should they tackle this issue? Right. If I have a client that's sending me funds from Darknet, okay, I know it's bad. But if the Darknet was five addresses away, what does that mean? Right, Because my client could have bought the Bitcoin from an, someone who innocently bought it from someone who innocently got it from the Darknet. And interestingly enough, you know, Bitcoin has been around for so long that when we did a network-wide analysis, we realized that almost most Bitcoin at one point or another have touched an illegal activity. So actually, you know, if you really think about it, most of the Bitcoin today is tainted, love, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use it, right? So what we do at Merkle Science, actually, aside from just looking at where these funds, these coins have come from, um, we also develop other algorithms like behavior-based rules to identify if somebody is trying to move their funds um, in multiple hops to try and hide where they came from, right? I feel that, you know, we live in this data-rich world and all the more so with blockchain, the amount of data we have to analyze is unprecedented. And the blockchain transaction monitoring space is also evolving very quickly. And I think this is one of the reasons why banks are in a rush to develop their own CBDCs, right? Because they realize that if they can get access to all this transaction data, then they can perform you know, new age analytics to help them with their compliance um, as well as their work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Ian. Anyone have anything to add on to that? <laughs> oh, because I have a question that uh, is coming again from Joshua that's addressed to what Lawrence previously has just addressed. So if there's anyone, no one that have anything to add on regarding to what Ian have mentioned, I'll just jump straight to that question. Right, I just, just want to quickly uh, mention is uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, as what Ian point out is uh, the compliance side or the regulation side, it has been very slow <laughs> compared to the pace of industry. And then it, it, it becomes a real concern, especially for institutions who want to put in money. Because the, the first thing people always go ask me is, hey, are you regulated? Hey, are you following the law? Uh, again, is I don't think any of us here is intentionally trying to break the law. It's just that this industry 
is so fast. It's like a Rappi and Gokki's uh, race where, you know, we are, we are racing around the track for many rounds already and then the, the regulation is like, eh, where are you going at one point? Okay, when once things are moving, we're already moving like don't know how many generations away and are still stuck at um uh how do we do KYC? <laughs> um so it has been a challenge. Uh so uh, again, uh I, I think it's for institutions um to, to understand that okay, uh, what what is the real crucial uh issues that you might need to be aware of. First is is our set safe, uh will it get hacked, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Second is uh, how are you going to your KYC? How are you going to ensure AML? Uh, because you know uh, your assets uh, when it's transacting, uh, you know you need to pay income tax. Uh, you need to pay uh, any other form of taxes. Uh, you cannot have bad actors uh, in between these transactions. Uh, but uh, apart from that, I think everything else is quite okay in this industry, based on what I know. Yeah. Okay, so I think for me to go right to the question that Joshua had again has uh, been addressing to Lawrence. So how do the stated yield from stake assets came about? Come about? Uh, okay, so, so a bit of background is uh, the whole point of proof of stake. Uh, so the proof of stake came out I think Q15 or so I can't really remember the exact year. Uh, for, for real key kills, you know, please, we can have another in-depth conversation or some write up, but basically, uh, proof of stake was an alternative proposed uh, consensus mechanism instead of proof of work. So, so proof of work is what Bitcoin Ethereum is based on. Proof of work meaning you say for every uh, uh, token you mine uh, uh, through the algorithm uh, server processing, you get this token reward, uh, and then you get gas fee rewards. So for proof of stake, uh, it was uh, also a consensus mechanism uh, in order to power blockchain, in order to reward so-called people who are believe in these projects without having to commit to servers. So, so less, lesser uh, electricity consumption. Uh, and in that sense, uh, exactly because there's lesser costs involved, you don't have to create uh, mining servers like Ethereum or Bitcoin. Um, that's where the original yields returns came from, uh, rewarding you for participating, for ensuring that this network uh, is legit, uh, for building this network to prevent 51% uh, takeover, uh, to, to prevent double spending. So that was the original intention of proof of stake. Uh, but now it's evolved to be very uh, vague, same as what equally token and payment tokens um, uh, has become where uh, DeFi projects has used staking pools to reward um, uh, uh, traders for not dumping the coin for staking with a project. So where currently these these records are coming from is uh, from from their DeFi investments in other projects. So it's called yield farming, where in the unit swap you can you can swap you can trade and then get the returns, or you can swap your token for another token and commit into their yield farming and get the returns and pay back to, to, your, to your investors. Uh, so currently this DeFi ecosystem has made this yield farming uh, and this staking pool returns more big and, and very complicated. Uh, so to answer your question in a simple uh, term is, uh, you are booking in your trust and token and then they are rewarding you for your trust and token through uh, activities that they will do uh, with the state assets. Yep. Hey, thank you so much, Lawrence. And uh, to Joshua, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, so next up, we have the question for tokenize. So where do you see a centralized exchange can play a role in a decentralized world? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, I understand, you know, our space is moving very fast. But end of the day, you know, like where regulators come from and where any jurisdiction or, or countries, um, you know, um, it's still very, how would I say, uh, putting, or maybe I should maybe, uh, take a step back and start first, you know, why, why a change exists at the, at, at the first place, right? Like why centralized a change exists in the decentralized world, right? like a big country they think, right? But the, the key essence is that uh, anyone that's new to the cryptocurrency or blockchain, you know, I mean, uh, cryptocurrency itself, like Bitcoin, you, know, you still need a gateway, right, to access the cryptocurrency. Like now you have sing dollars, but how do you buy 
uh, Bitcoin, how do you buy Ethereum and so on, right? So you need a platform and, and we are the platform. And, and after that, you know, start from a small platform, it evolved into an exchange uh, that facilitated all the buyer and seller for, for trading. And then, and after that, you know, with the rising of DeFi, rising of all the other platforms. So what is our role right now? I think our role right now is, you know, where the regulators and where the countries, uh, because we are the gateway that facilitate a lot of traffic of our cryptocurrency tradings. So, you know, countries and also regulators are looking on us as the intermediaries, right? Where, you know, compliance topic, where regulations topic is coming to us right now because we are the key risk also uh, that associated uh, in this industry where we facilitate on the fiat on off ramp where you know the local currency like sing dollars uh, traded to the cryptocurrency like bitcoin and so on and the new rising coins no matter cardano no matter you know um, even polka dot the newly uh, uh, projects that uh, label as an ethereum killer uh, we still need uh, intermediaries right to facilitate um, fiat to crypto. Maybe a decade later, this can be fully decentralized with uh, you know rising of CBDC and everything. But at this juncture, you know uh, we are at the stage that we still need um, centralized operators to facilitate on the fiat side, right? So I think this is where we uh, tokenize themselves. Where I think we are still at the early stage. There are a lot of people still want to assess into the cryptocurrency. Compared to where we started, we see tremendous increment on the audience. And, you know, we are excited to be here to provide the accessibility to the mass market. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, just, just to add on to that, actually, um, one thing that I want to say is that, you know, DeFi is great if you are tech savvy. Because when you want to interact with DeFi, you actually have to use your own wallet. Right, which means that you are responsible for protecting your cryptocurrency, storing it in your own hardware, software, wallet. Um, and unfortunately, there is this is not that simple as what a lot of people think. And um, in our work in this space, we've actually seen many instances of people who you know, incorrectly use their wallet, get fished, and then have their cryptocurrency stolen. So I think one of the advantages of going through a regulated exchange is also the ease of use. Right? You put your funds with them, they protect it for you, right? and they make it easier for you to access these DeFi platforms. Because for somebody who's not tech savvy, right? It can be quite challenging, I can tell you, someone who's tried it out myself, right? So I think some of the value that, you know, these intermediaries provide, yes, the fiat side, but I think we need to understand that um, the larger consumer base, a lot of these retailers just don't have the sophistication and as well as, you know, they don't know how to protect their assets securely, in which case, you know, actually outsourcing it to a regulated intermediary can be much safer and easier for them. Yep, thanks, Ian. Uh, totally agree on that. And I think the same similar things, I just want to echo in back to Ian, and where I also can echo in back to Lawrence, is that because the DeFi space has progressed so fast that a lot of people think, you know, uh, staking is like what we are looking at now at the DeFi space, you know, getting uh, some Shushi token or Uni token, and this is called staking and, and so-called yield, yield farming, right? But at the, at the early days, we have to understand that, you know, like Bitcoin, how Bitcoin is coming is from the hardware, Right, mining machine, and you get the Bitcoin uh, from the mining machine. Right, then after that, there's a new consensus algorithm where you know the problem with hardware, you know, there's electricity, you know, there's there's a lot of debate on environment, not, not friendly. But the key, I think, the key crucial challenge here is the scaling issue. Right, with hardware, you imagine with hardware, there will be different specs for different miners, and everything there's a hardware limitations. So we have to move into another solutions where proof of stake, uh, you know, leverage fully on software is, is, is what people see that is an alternative to grow. Even Ethereum, you know, when we talk about Ethereum 2.0, they are moving to proof of stake. So what literally it do is that they change how the mining work, right? Become, you know, you own a coin, you put it together, it become a validator. Right. I think Ian can definitely do a better job on explain, explaining why it's validators and nodes. But uh, what I'm trying to come in from there is that even you know you go to the new consensus mechanism and proof of stake to set up the node and validators, right? It's not everyone has the expertise, right? So company like Moonstake is here, here to facilitate, right? It's just like our exchange. If uh, they are still individuals struggling to have their to set up their own individual wallet, a like Bitcoin wallet, Ethereum wallet, right? Uh, so you know instead of going through the hustle 
especially like for 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 certain audience, right? Uh, why not just leverage on our platform, right? To 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 serve as your your cryptocurrency wallet purposes. So uh, you know, it is the same thing. If you don't know how to stake, set up on a on a nodes or validators, and sometimes the validators need a quite a huge chunk pool of coins. You can leverage on a platform like Moonstake to serve the purpose, right? So yeah. All right, so <clears throat> thank you everyone. So we are actually coming to an end for panel discussion, but we are going to proceed next to the Q&A. So thank you everyone for sharing your basically thoughts. And I think the key takeaway is definitely coming from Ian. So if you are going to crypto, you need to be tech savvy, right? If not, just use the centralized exchanges. <laughs> I'll help you out. So, <clears throat> okay, so moving on to the next question, the Q&A. So our first question we have is from Citra. Akan Citra, if I pronounce your name wrongly, please. My apologies, not really good with names. So, okay, the first question will be, over 40% of people in the world do not have access to basic electricity, education, access to internet, or the financial knowledge. And traditional finance help the illiterate. So decentralized finance help on the privilege. Isn't the former more inclusive then? So anyone has anyone, anything to say on this? I, I, I will take these questions because I think, you know, this is a topic Surprisingly, we come from another anchor since we started and we are in conference or we are in a exhibitions. The, 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 the reality is that, you know, like you can see country like Pakistan or, or, you know, Indonesia, right? They have, most of them, they actually have accessibility, accessibility to mobile phone, right? Compared to bank account. Well, uh, if I may put another way is that those who have mobile phone in those so-called third world countries, right? Uh, uh, the, the percentage are seem easily double than those who have access to bank account. Right? There are few statistics I can show, but this is actually a bit outdated two years back. But I believe the numbers will still around that range. If I'm not wrong, the Philippines, right, 60% of them, they don't have traditional, they don't have access to traditional bank account. But more than 80% of them, they have mobile phone. Same to Indonesia or Pakistan. Pakistan, I, I still remember quite clearly, is because uh, the end financial, they have some projects enter to the to that uh, jurisdictions. They provide cash services, they provide mobile app. And the, the, the statistic of them who are able to access, uh, you know, to the RDP is actually higher than her traditional banking uh, system. So, so if you put it into that perspective, right, the, the blockchain uh, industry is actually able to penetrate and give accessi uh, accessibility more on the populations compared to the tra traditional banking, right? So, so this is very interesting. Uh, this is the first time I see it from another perspective that, you know, on the, on the electricity, education, and access. Because even South Africa or Africa region, if you look now, right, the, the, the blockchain industry actually pro, uh, prosperous there, right? They, they get into the financial uh, inclusiveness in, in those regions, right? It's actually more than previously. Uh, the banking is, has been in the world for more than a few decades already, but, you know, the adoption still can't really take place in those jurisdictions. But with blockchain, you know, for the past only like two years, it accelerated a lot, right? If you see uh, who, uh, those population, they actually have more literacy in terms of cryptocurrency and accessibility compared to even, you know, Singapore. So, so I just want to give that kind of perspective. So hopefully you can, yeah, can change your mind. How about Lawrence? Yeah, or oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so to echo what Chi is say, uh, this, this actually was a, it's a, it's a personal experience. So um, in Ku Wangye, I was based in Thailand. So actually I did force a few of my friends there to buy uh, Ethereum or BTC. And now they get me for it. Uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, two, two of them lose their jobs uh, because of, you know, they were involved in FMB. Uh, actually, they opened uh, FMB and all that. So uh, they are still able to earn quite a bit uh, due to the current uh, bull run and still be able to pay their bills. Uh, if they didn't have the uh, exchange or the cryptocurrency access in Thailand, I think they will be suffering a lot right now. Uh, but a, a more um, uh, realistic perspective on this and thinking to anyone in the Singapore government side or, or banking side is uh, um, their exchange license or their, their license uh, brokerage uh, can uh, allow direct bank integration 
which is why currently you know you, you don't feel it in Singapore because they can directly on board and off board directly to your bank account. Um, so to answer the question, the ecosystem there, it actually has helped a lot of people during this COVID, uh, especially during this COVID, it has helped even those who are not as rich. Uh, it's just that maybe you don't feel in Singapore because <laughs> we are a bit well more well off, uh, but definitely uh, I think it uh, first hand experience. Ian, do you have anything to add on to that? Um, no, I, I think Akan definitely pointed out an issue, right? Um, but I think DeFi or traditional finance, there are some hurdles that people definitely, that are still existing for both, right? Education, right, is one that definitely, you know, if you do not use DeFi, you can't access it. If you don't have education, you may not also know how to get access to, you know, traditional finance, right? The worst thing that can happen is that, you know, um, without sufficient education, you try and get in and you end up losing all your money. Right. What I will say, though, is that I think when we talk about DeFi being more inclusive, we really mean that it is open to anyone who is able to participate. Whereas with traditional finance, you know, there's all these hurdles. They'll do credit checks on you for people in third world countries where, you know, they have no assets, right? Even if they do have crypto, people aren't going to recognize that as an asset, which allows them to take loans. They have no credit scores, right? Whereas with DeFi, pe DeFi doesn't judge you based on your background. Right. As long as you know you have the ability to access it, you can participate. Whereas traditional finance, because of you know compliance issues of banks having their own standards as to you know what constitute a high risk customer, they would typically exclude um, people who cannot prove their financial stability. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the next question, uh, we have from Lawrence. So for AML, what do you guys think? What do you guys think of the transactions going through Tornado? So I guess this is mine. Um, so to give you guys a little bit of background, Tornado is um, what we would commonly term as a mixer, right? It's a service um, provider that allows people to hide where their transactions are coming and going, right? Now, this kind of mixing services is not uncommon. Right. In fact, it's been around for a long time. And in the early days, a lot of criminals used to use it. Um, but nowadays, right, an interesting fact, mixers can actually get licensed in the US. They can apply for a license, right, be regulated, and actually mix people's money for them to hide um, their cryptocurrency transactions legitimately. Right, because I mean, around the world, let's let's be honest, right? We talked about how Bitcoin is transparent and all this. There are people who care about their privacy. Right? There are people who are sitting on billions of dollars of crypto and they don't want anybody to know because I don't want to be kidnapped. Right, We had that incident in Singapore where that guy got kidnapped probably because he made the news as being rich. So it's a lot of legitimate reasons for using mixers or privacy enabling tokens. Right, So let's not you know, say they're all inherently bad. So my personal thoughts of, as to transactions going through Tornado is it's a necessary service. Right. Um, but what we do from the AML side is that whenever these funds go through mixers, we can actually tell because these mixers mix their funds in a very structured manner. There are certain telltale signs. So what we do actually is that we simply tell our clients, hey, you have a customer that is sending funds to your exchange from a mixer. What do you think about it? Right. Because like I said, mix, some mixers can be licensed. They can be regulated. Right. But then at the same time, other jurisdictions take a very hard stance that, hey, you know, all mixes are high risk. As a business, you better not touch. Right. So it's a difficult question to tackle because the stance uh, is not the same from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ian, for sharing. So we'll begin to the next question. And the next question is from Sean. And with the growth, I think this is much more targeted towards Lawrence as well as. Uh, to you. So with the, growth, with the growth of decentralized finance, we can see decentralized exchange technologies are rap rapidly evolving and larger decentralized exchanges such as Uniswap and SushiSwap are able to provide equivalent or better rates and liquidity when compared to centralized exchanges. So these platforms are also increasingly integrated into crypto wallets, both on mobile, web and desktop, greatly simplifying their ease of use. In your opinion, do centralized exchanges still have a clear role to play in the decentralized finance and larger crypto ecosystem beyond serving as a fiat on-off ramp? Well, that's a long question. So anyone would like to 
take the kid first? I'll, I'll pass it to Siri first. <laughs> sure. Actually, actually uh, this is very interesting. And to be honest, as a central exchange, you know, founder, um, I can't say that, you know, um, the, prog the progress of decentralized uh, exchange is, is uh, not fascinating or, you know, um, not, not coming to a point that, you know, it can be a, a, our direct competitors, right? It's, it's a real question. But we want to take a step back and not try to um, play down decentralized exchange is that there are real, a lot of real issue. And I think if I can pro you know, throw back the questions to Sean, I think you will agree also, is that, you know, uh, currently if you're using decentralized uh, uh, exchange, the fee, the gas fee involved, right, for, for you to change a $1,000 value or a few hundred dollars value, it doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? Because the gas fee can easily uh, become 100 and 200 US dollars, just the gas fee itself. And you, you, you also need to take note the exchange like Sushi Swap or Uniswap, they take around 3% fee, correct me if I'm not wrong. So the fee is, is really uh, expensive compared to the central exchange, right? And there's a lot of technology limitation issue like gas fee that, you know, can easily add up uh, unreasonable cost for you. Right, which I don't think at this point, although I, I, I think I'm very impressed with the liquidity issue that they have this struggle for past two to three years, it already being resolved. But at the ease of use and also as, as a practicality, I think there's still a gap for decentralized exchange, right? And, and I will go a bit technical, uh, bear with me for a while, is that, uh, you know, for the, decent, uh, the, 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 the decentralized exchange, they're using some algorithm, like Uniswap 50-50, it's an algorithm that they uh, behave very differently compared to a central exchange where we use order book, right? Means that, you know, it's, it's based on ratio, right? So if there's a selling, the ratio will just keep dropping. This is why, you know, there are a lot of deep back issue in DeFi and there's a lot of hacking can be done um, through, through um, deep backing the, the certain pairing, right? Then after that, you know, there's this terminology called rug pool where the project owner can literally just uh, suck, suck another pool, like the stable coin, USDT or others uh, away from the liquidity pool. So there are a lot of, um, I think there's, I mean, it's great the progress so far, but I think there are a lot of real challenges still persist where I think the decentralized uh, finance project or that the decentralized exchange own, uh, project owners, they have to relook and see how they need to solve the technical challenge. And if really one day they have solved all these things, you know, there is still a problem that, you know, to offer to the mass market because the mass market is still holding the fiat, right? They're still holding their local currency and you still need a bridge um, to, to go to port over to, you know, our, our dimension, right? The cryptocurrency dimensions or the DeFi dimension. So I think, you know, there are still a lot of things, um, you know, we, you know, we still can serve the community. I would say this way. Yeah. Right. Uh, could, could add on to, uh, to uh, personally, I, I love the DeFi space. Um, the returns has been amazing, but uh, I will not actually recommend anyone to go into it until you, uh, yeah, until you really know what's going on, which can be quite complicated. Like, like what exactly happens in your farming? If you go look at you, I think you'll be quite scared to come into the DeFi space. Um, but that was the reason why uh, we started Moonscape uh, for the wallet solution and staking pool uh, because it is just an easier proposition. Yeah, you can know, just deposit your assets in your wallet and then skate accordingly. Uh, we'll add in uh, more and more tokens as we uh, you know, analyze their project quality, you know, blockchain quality, we'll have more functions available. We work with more institutional partners to uh to onboard um the, the, the staking pool services to them. Um, but at this stage, even for ourselves, even me personally, uh, half of the time I have no idea what's going on in DeFi. <laughs> the, 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 it, like I, I think Ian can explain like the, the way the addresses are are, are are being connected is just I, I I just I'm lost reading the first three notes really. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for sharing. So we will now proceed to our last question for this today the, in the Q&A session uh, from Leonard. So what are your thoughts on the impact of high gas fees on decentralization versus centralization? 
So I guess Chi, you're talking about high gas fee, right? So yeah, but but I, I think uh, you know although we are centralized operators, um, you know, but uh, the the cryptocurrency that we facilitate like Bitcoin or Ethereum and so on or even Polkadot, we use their own blockchain networks, right? So so even we as a, a central exchange, we are I believe not just we like like any central exchanges in the world right now. Uh, we are paying a lot of fees and we do a lot of subsid subsidize on the Ethereum uh, transactions, right? I can be very, very uh, honest and frank that currently each transaction, sometimes it can, at the peak, it can cost easily 100 US dollar or 200 US dollar per transaction. It's, it's really crazy. And, and we still pay that cost for our user, right? So I think the gas fee issue is very real. Uh, until, I think if you talk about Ethereum, until 2.0, um, there's nothing much we can do now. Um, we definitely also try to I and certain way that we can, like my like Bitcoin, they can do a block, uh, they can do a batch transactions. So I think they are not now more proposal like EIP. Um, is it one four five five? I think they, uh, there is certain EIP that they are trying to roll out to to see how we can reduce uh, the gas gas fee challenge, right? But uh, I think no matter centralized or decentralized, as long as we are facilitating on the respective network. Their limitation will still pretty much hit us. But if we talk about another alternative, is that let's say you are one of our users and you're trying to transfer to another user. Now most of the central exchange, uh, you know, providing a free transfer uh, because at the end of the day, it's just our internal system swap, right? So all these things will become make more sense at you know at this at this juncture where instead of paying, like let's say imagine you just want to transfer hundred. Uh, sing dollar worth of Ethereum to your friend, instead of using the blockchain, which you easily cost another hundred percent, literally what you want to send to your friend, you can just use our you know system to to serve the purpose at a zero cost. Right? I think this is something that you can, you can uh, you know, I can think of that you can leverage on centralized system or exchange. Okay, so I guess Ian, what is your take on this? Um. So yeah, transaction fees are a huge issue, right? And and just so everybody knows, transaction fees are not fixed. Um, they are really up to people to set. And basically, when the network is very popular, um, people have to pay more transaction fees in order to prioritize their transaction. Otherwise, you know, as somebody who's paying $100 versus somebody who's paying $10, naturally, the $100 is going to be transacted first because miners want to earn more money, not less money, right? Interesting story. So transaction fees, I think, is really an issue. The other day, I was trying to play around with DeFi platforms myself. And, you know, regardless of what tokens you're transacting, you need to pay transaction fee Ethereum. So what happened was, you know, I moved 100 USDT into my wallet and then I wanted to play on the DeFi, but I couldn't because I had to pay with the transaction fee in Ethereum. So then I had to move 10, no, $50 worth of Ethereum inside to pay transaction fees. And then when I was done, playing around with DeFi, I then wanted to withdraw my coins out of my MetaMask into my main wallet. So I then made the mistake of first withdrawing my Ethereum and then wanting to draw withdraw my USDT. But guess what? After I withdraw my Ethereum, I got no money to pay my gas fees to withdraw my USDT. So then I had to move Ethereum in again to withdraw my USDT and then withdraw my Ethereum. And that cost me a ridiculous amount of money that should not have <laughs> have happened. But yes, transaction fees are an issue. And I think as what you said, until we get to layer two on, Ether, on Ethereum, um, as well as there are a couple of solutions out there which are looking for alternatives, but until that is solved, uh, it will have a big impact on the DeFi platform because if you have to pay, you know, 50 to $100 in fees, that means that the returns you make must definitely cover that, right? Otherwise it's not economical, which means that it is, excluding people who may not have that much capital, right? Um, so I think this is definitely something that needs to be solved. Otherwise, you're going to see people migrating away from Ethereum to other blockchains, which can hire more throughput. Um, yeah, that's just my, my two cents and my sad story. <laughs> I mean, you're not the only one. I, I, I'm sure most of the first timers may have uh, you know, faced that issue. Uh, I mean, I faced that issue myself as well, sad to say. So, yeah. Lawrence, do you have anything to add on? Uh, no, no, I feel, feel your pain. Uh, thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. 
I and always happy to hear other people's pain because I went through it like, wow, this is not the only one. <laughs> yeah, so Leonard, I hope they answer your question. So we have now um, answered all the Q&As as well as the panel discussion and we have come to an end of our panel discussion, quick fire panel discussion for today. So if, and thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any other additional question or feedback, please drop Lawrence an email uh, and it's the email that Basically, we send it over to you via the link. If not, it's lawrence.lin, L-I-N, at moonstick.io. Or simply refer to your Zoom registration email for Moonstick's contact detail. So have a good week ahead and see you guys next time. Thank you, everyone. Right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, thank you Lawrence. Thank, thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Roy and Ian. Bye. Bye.